All right, so without further ado, I'll pass it off to Jason. He's going to talk about high dimensional uh, functional learning, some interesting computational aspects and theoretical aspects of provable error bounds, things like that. So, it's all you. Thank you. Yeah, I want to thank uh, Joe for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak here. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I was really excited to be able to share with a mix of the crowd from industry and possibly from academia. My crowd tends to be usually academia. I'm a, um, a you were from the bio, I'm a fourth year PhD student at Yale. And this is just a bit of the research I've been working on. It's more the, I guess, sort of at the cutting edge of what I'm working on right now. I, I didn't really choose to talk about the stuff that I had done previously. If you're interested in that, you could I just look at my website and look at some of the stuff that I have on there. Um, so, yeah, I just got to give you an outline of what some of the things I'll be talking about. So, the, the whole goal of everything is just to develop a procedure for flexible high, dimen high dimensional function estimation. And the types of functions that we use are linear combinations of uh, certain types of basis functions, and these functions could be sigmoids or they, they could be other non uh, decreasing continuous, maybe Lipschitz uh, activation functions. Or they could also be polynomial activation functions. Um, and some of the other things we'll talk about are the approximation and estimation bounds that are new, and then also some of the prior ones to sort of motivate the new ones. Then I'll talk about a type of dimension reduction technique um, known as uh, the greedy, uh, greedy algorithm, and actually a specific instance of it, a specific variation of it. Um, that motivates the ability for us to develop uh, more computationally feasible strategies. And the particular one that I'm going to be talking about now is called adaptive annealing. And, uh, and adaptive annealing certainly isn't the only one that you could use. Um, more recently, the uh, so-called tensor methods have been gaining um, popularity in, in their ability to solve from these types of problems like neural network training other types of things. So yeah, that's the that's the other one. So I'm a statistician and so everything that I'm gonna be talking about, like the data comes from some model. And that's you know, statisticians we like models, so that's what I'm gonna be assuming. So I have a data is just a tuple, I have a vector xi and that's realized in R to the D, and then I have some uh, response value vector that's just the, each of the coordinates of the yi are just in R. Um, I assume that the domain that I'm looking at is either R to the D or some hypercube. And really, you could just think of R as being one, without loss of generality. Um, usually, these things scale, like the bound scale. So uh, the random design is just some, again, some Xi, which is a vector in R to the D, and, we, and it comes from some probability, it's generated from some probability distribution. We're not, not necessarily assuming that we know it. And the output, I guess it is a response, a real value response variable, and we assume that it takes the form of some function and then some additive noise. And the noise could be zero, we don't necessarily have to have noise. You know, again, if you're a statistician thinking, well, you know, if epsilon i is zero, is there really anything we need to do? And well, yes, there is stuff you need to do because you still only observe the function at a certain number of sites or cells. And the bounds that we develop, we need to assume some condition on epsilon. We just assume a standard Bernstein type condition. And so you can really think of it as, you know, if you're not really, if you think this is an awkward condition, you can just think of epsilon as being maybe like a sub-gaussian, like a normal, or even a bounded random variable. Um, and so yeah, the, the relationship is some conditional response, and I've just highlighted a few different instances of these relationships. So. Uh, the, the last one that some people might be more interested in is because that enable us to um, model classification type problems. So the next slide. And so like I said, we're going to be modeling these general functions using linear combinations of types, different types of activation functions. And the ones that I'm interested in are piecewise constants, so indicators of, uh, well, what these things will be arguments of, of uh, uh, inner products. but these are just for now uh, univariate functions. So indicators, uh, sigmoids, so linear spline ramp functions, second order spline functions, sin sinusoidal functions, 
Um, these could be polynomial or hermite. The hermite polynomials now are gaining popularity because of their um, uh, connection with, uh, with uh, the tensor methods that I alluded to earlier. Um, and for the theory that I'm going to be developing now, we mainly are just working with general Lipschitz functions. So not necessarily differentiable or bounded differentiable, but you could think of them as being like that. And of course, you can build, uh, you, can, you can extend this to consider multivariate activation functions by just looking at products of these mm -hmm. univariate functions. So next slide. Um, Yes, and so like I guess there were going to be fitting functions with as linear combinations of these the activation functions, and the functions or the 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 linear the, the activation functions are going to be assumed to coming from some dictionary. So the dictionary is just parameterized by some vector in, in R to the D, and um, we may be assuming in some cases that the L1 norm is bounded. L1 norm of the internal parameter. And so, yeah, and ridge, ridge bases are useful for things like uh, projection pursuit models, um, single hidden layer neural nets. I'm not really going to be talking about any deep learning, so just single hidden layer. And um, like I was saying before, these activation functions are built from the univariate functions feed, so we just evaluate them at the inner product of the data with some vector in part of it. So the note, some of the notation I'll be using, so again, I talked about the response vector being some element in order to be n. Dictionary vectors are just the, the, the uh, activation functions evaluated at the sites of the observations, and I have that notation for that. The empirical squared norm is just the average of the square of the observations, uh, squared values of f of the observations, and its corresponding population <coughs> counterpart. And I'm also going to be assuming that there's a condition on the dictionary elements and that they're, they're normalized to be not greater than one in, in the L2 norm. You could, you could even put a stronger condition on it. You could, you could put, uh, you know, that they're bounded in the L infinity norm or something like that. But it's, it's for our purposes, it's good enough to just assume this. So, I, the impractical way of doing this is just to, you know, you have, you have your data and you want to be able to model it in terms of these linear combinations and you could just do a one-shot approach where you simultaneously try to minimize some criterion over, the squared error criterion over all the thetas and all the seeds and clearly that's not feasible because of the optimization problem here. And that, that's not m factorial, that's, it's not that bad. But. <laughs> I meant to emphasize that it's still bad because you're doing an optimization, basically a d times m dimensional optimization problem. And of course, m is also going to uh, play a role in the uh, accuracy of the approximation. So the, the, high, the larger m is, the, the, the better the approximation error you'll get. And it's going to be, of course, related to the statistical error as well, because there's, as you'll see, there's going to be a there's going to be a trade-off between the statistical error and the approximation error. Um, so yeah, this, this is just to show that this is sort of the impractical way of doing this. So we need to develop procedures that, are, uh, that, that can overcome this. So as I was saying earlier in, the, in one part of the outline, I'm talking about greedy strategies for, for doing this. And I think this is probably one of the most relaxed greedy strategies just because it, it, it really, you don't have to quite optimize things or even find vectors that achieve a certain optimal value. You could just basically come within some constant factor of the maximum. And that's actually quite important for what we're going to be talking about later. So at step one of the iteration, you take your, just your observations yi with the uh, phi's and you optimize over the theta vector. And what's important is that you only need to come to, uh, within some constant that's less than one of that maximum. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, and that's and that's quite important. And that, that constant W is fixed, so it's not changing with the iterations. And then what we do in the end, this is again still in the first step, is we choose some C1 
that uh, minimizes its distance from the data and then just one, uh, one particular activation function. And then what we do is we uh, arrange the new, so having, having, having built the FM-1 in this fashion, we update it as being some combination of the previous fit, so 1 minus alpha m, and then some new term from the dictionary. And then we do a similar procedure, except now, rather than having the yi's, we use these ri's, which are the residuals. So the yi's minus the, um, minus the data evaluated the previous fit. And, and again, we just need to come to within some constant factor of the maximum. We don't need to achieve it. Or we don't even need to say, okay, well, it's the maximum plus some thresholds plus some epsilon, where epsilon goes to zero. It's just some constant factor of the maximum. And then, really what this is in the last step is just some, it's just a regression problem. So you're just it's essentially a two-dimensional regression problem. You're to find the alpha and the CN, because they're just, uh, alpha is a real number, C is a real number. So. Uh, yeah, okay. And so what we can do, what we can say with, with this strategy, um, we can, I think that's an error actually. Yeah, but I think basically what it, what it meant to say is that you can come to within, I think you should just ignore the first term, and just say that you can come to within BF over M of the um, optimal. And this constant BF depends on some spectral norm of F and then so the norm of the data squared. And the spectral norm here, this F sub phi, um, so it's called the variation of F with respect to phi, sometimes it's called the atomic norm. It was defined by Barron in IEEE in 1991, and it's been used since. It's a very important quantity. Um, and it sort of captures the complexity of the function, and we'll see that arising more often. And so the so if we have say a finite if we have a function that has a finite uh, representation so in terms of these linear combinations that variation is really just the just the L1 norm of the coefficients. So this is a, this is just trying to motivate that definition. Of course, you know f might not actually be exactly equal to some linear combination, but in this special case, you have that um, you have that representation. So what we what we're going to be doing is really just assuming that f is it's just an L1, so it has some Fourier representation, and we'll restrict the x the data to be in the uh, or sorry the, the domain of the function to be in the unit hyper key. So then. The variation f is bounded by an L1 spectral norm. So if we're wanting to model f as being uh, some linear combination of cosine functions, we need that the absolute value, the magnitude of the Fourier transform is finite. And then if we're doing that for step functions, we need a slightly stronger uh, assumption. And if we're doing that for ramp functions, and ramp functions are nice because they're Lipschitz. They're continuous, they're Lipschitz. And we can also use quadratic splines, so uh, uh, activation functions that are differential. And for that, you need, a, you need an even stronger condition. And I should also mention, so, so basically these conditions ensure that not only is F representable, representable as linear combinations of these activation functions, but also that the closure of the convex hull of those uh, uh, of, of, of those um, uh, dictionary elements uh, uh, contains f. So the closure being maybe mainly limits of these linear combinations with respect to the L P norm. Um, and of course, these con these quantities here depend on the dimension. They're sort of they are dimension dependent, and of course, they come in the bounds. And in 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 some cases, they don't. They might not be exponential in dimension, because we want to avoid that. But, uh, so in the case of uh, modeling, say, the uh, Gaussian with um, uh, step functions, the second quantity in there is of order squared d. So it's not too bad. Uh, okay, so the next thing. And so, as statisticians, we're interested in we're interested in, in knowing how well procedure will generalize to new data on average. 
And so one way of quantifying and recapturing that is this notion of the risk, so statistical risk. And it's loosely defined as, as follows. Um, yeah, so like it says there, we want to see how well the, the new data generalizes. And we get these types of risk bounds, um, and blah, 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 you have to kind of play around with metric entropy and optimize it, and you get these types of bounds for that square error. So the first one you can see is you have that, you have that norm there, and you have something like D on N. So really what you need is you need N the sample size to be at least D, otherwise these bounds are kind of useless. Or new bounds which are which are coming out. Um, this is, we have a paper on this one, is that N with with a slightly worse rate, you have a one over four rate, but N might not need to be sort of like logarithmic in the dimension for the bounds to make sense. I, again, I, but I, you know, the, the spectral norms of F also do involve the dimension. But in some yeah, in some cases they, they might actually be bounded. They might not even involve the dimension. In other cases, they might be exponential in the dimension, and of course, you want to avoid situations like that. Um, so these are, these are sort of the classic type risk bounds that you can get on these things. And um, right, so let me the next slide. And using um, so this is this is more newer stuff. This is stuff that I've worked on. Um, you can all come up with penalized methods for doing these things. So we actually penalize the uh, minimization by some uh, uh, control basically on the coefficients. Again, if you're thinking of f, f as being a linear combination, finite linear combination of um, these uh, activation functions, you know, again, that norm is sort of like the L, L1 norm of those coefficients. And so essentially what we're doing in this procedure is we're penalizing, uh, we're penalizing that squared error norm by the L1 norm of the coefficients of the candidate function. And what this does is it actually yields improved risk bounds. So you can see that the bounds are slightly improved, but they degrade as the dimension increases. Because you have like a one on, you know, in this case it's a one on 2D like behavior. This is a one on uh, four, yeah, two times D behavior. So they're slightly better. And actually, uh, uh, yeah, if you're if you're into theory, um, these these bounds are almost minimax optimal. Um, but that's really only if you're a, statist a theoretical statistician. Like, like um, so yeah, I, I, I do want to highlight in this in the second case that you know if you're a practitioner, you really want to and you want to know okay, well how well do your uh, you know do your procedures uh, quantify the new data? Of course, you need bounds, and those bounds are important. And in the first instance, this is again this is the classic risk bound that's been used for a long time, probably like 15 years and stuff. And it really only makes sense if the data is at least the size of the dimension. That's really all that's useful. In the second case, it's a little bit better, but again, you have that rate that's that's worse um, because you only need to assume that n is larger than d, but you compromise that with a worse rate. Um, okay, so next slide. So yeah, again, this was all just that was all just the theory aspect of it. That's you know that's that's the stuff that's really you know true to my heart and what I've worked at for quite a few years. But you know we care about whether these things can actually be computed. That's a very important question. And so the remaining uh, remainder of the talk will be addressing those obstacles. So again, as, as I was talking about before, the greedy search reduces the dimensionality of the optimization from m times d to roughly d, where you where you're doing m d-dimensional optimization problems rather than doing just m times d at once. And that's the, that was that, uh, uh, the, 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 kind of the first slide I had where you just do everything at once. That's m times d-dimensional uh, optimization problem. It's clearly impractical. You just can't do it. So what we need to do is, in the greedy algorithm, you obtain a theta m by, again, coming to within this constant factor of the uh, the, the um, inner product of the residuals with the activation functions. That's what this is. Those ri's are a of the residuals. So the yi minus the previous fit of the greedy algorithm. And so this type of a service, it can have many maxima. You might get stuck at spurious local maximum. Maximums is, I mean, it's completely non-convex. There's no guarantee for that. And so we need to come up with new computational strategies. And one of them, that would uh, we've been working on right now is adaptive annealing. So it's an annealing type of schedule where you do some cooling and um, the 
type of distribution that you're wanting to track um, has some desirable properties, which we'll mention now. So, next slide. So what you, what you do in the adaptive annealing is you sample thetas from an evolving density, so a density that's sort of that's changing with the time, with time, and the time goes from zero up until some t final, and the final could be something like a polynomial in D. That's what you can usually see it to be like, and it's related to some quantity which I'm going to describe <coughs> later on. So the initial distribution, so when t is equal to zero you're really just sampling from P0. And that should be some type of distribution that's easy to sample from. So something like a normal, or um, we're finding it's useful to sample from more heavy tail type distributions, like distribu or densities that decay polynomially. So you could have something like Cauchy's, or, or even densities that have uh, bounded support, like uniforms on some ball. And I say T final should be of order D log D, and that's kind of true because that's sort of like the, the D log D comes. So the T final is actually related to the log of the prob of the initial probability of you being in some desirable set, and usually that that is the the, the, me the measure of that is usually like the measure of some Euclidean ball, and the log cardinality of the Euclidean ball is sort of like D log D. So that's kind of like it. Sort of an intuitive explanation for why that should be like that, but again, it might not. It might actually be larger. It might be something like polynomial in, in the dimension. So, starting from the random theta zero, um, which again is follows that p zero distribution, you you increase t slightly, so you increase it by some h, and now you're sampling from p h. So h is just some small quantity. So you're sampling from new, some new distribution. And of course, it could be extremely difficult to sample from that. Because, um, well, for one thing, you don't know that CT factor. Because that's the normalizing constant to make this a density. And that involves a high dimensional integration. So you want to kind of avoid doing that. So what we do is, uh, if you go to the next line, what we do is um, we, we evolve the distribution according to some change function. But I'll, I'll first comment on why we would even care about wanting, or why, why we'd want to sample from something like this. And the reason is because of this lemma. So essentially what it says is that if, so remember theta m is the, is the good guy that we'd like to get to. That's, that's the nth step of the greedy algorithm. We want to know that parameter. So if you assume that um, there's some set of theta values that, uh, for which uh, J in, in its magnitude is not too far away from J of the optimal value. So J is the, uh, I defined it in the, the other slide, it's, it's the function that we'd like to optimize. It's the linear, it's, it's the inner product of the residuals with the activation function. And uh, so what this lemma says is that, yeah, if we have J of theta in a ball being not too far away from J of theta of the optimal value, then if T is at least this quantity, the mean of that distribution, is at least some constant factor of the maximum of that objective function. And that's exactly the, uh, that's exactly the criterion that we need for the uh, greedy algorithm to work. So we need the, the yeah, and so, and so in practice what you do is you evolve L samples in parallel, because this is a parallelizable algorithm, and you look at the sample average and you say, okay, well, using some kind of, um, you know, um, uh, <coughs> Uh, strong, uh, law of, uh, strong law of large numbers uh, uh, type theorem, you can say, okay, well, it's approximately mu t. And then what we do to choose the final theta m is we look at the arg maximum of the, the j. And you can use some kind of, you know, Hofting's inequality to say that you need something like log 1 over delta number of uh, uh, parallel samples for that maximum to be within a constant factor of that mean, with, with at least probability of these one. So this is kind of the goal. So really, really, the, the whole goal is just that we have a distribution and we want to sample from it. Why do we want to sample from it? Because we know that its mean comes within a constant factor, in this case half, of the maximum of that objective function that works for the greedy algorithm. So that's the whole goal. The whole goal now is just that we want to be able to sample from that PT. And so how do we do it? So the next slide. Um, so what we do is we set up a change function so that if we're at a theta t, we want to know, okay, well, what do I need to do so that I'm 
uh, I'm, I'm updating the, the rule so that the theta t plus h tracks p t plus h. Because again, the whole time I want to be tracking this distribution nicely. I don't want to be veering too far away from it because then I won't be able to say anything about its mean anymore. You know, I won't be able to apply my uh, you know, probability tricks to be able to say, okay, well, how far am I on average? You know, with, with a certain probability from the, the mean. Um, so what you just assume is that uh, theta minus h times the j function is invertible, has some positive definite Jacobian, blah, 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 blah. These are just sort of theoretical conditions. Um, and there are many... There are many such change functions, and there are infinitely many of them. In fact, and they're not all nice. So one, one of the problems is that the change function could depend on the dimension, possibly exponentially, because you know we do the, because of the nature of the of the type of distribution we're sampling from. You know, it's like e to the t times something. And, you know, if I said t is like a polynomial in d, it kind of seems a little scary that you might get these exponential swings. So we want to. Uh, try to avoid that. So it not again, not every change function is nice. So let's explore some of the change functions. Um, and what and what actually what they need to satisfy. So this is really just um, a very crude proof of what the change function needs to satisfy. And I guess the take home is just that the partial derivative of PT with respect to time should equal the divergence of the change function times PT. This is like a, uh, this is a really an extension of the Fokker-Planck theory. This is also a, uh, a sort of a special case of that. But this is sort of a, this is a fundamental equation, differential equation that needs to be solved. And so if you go to the next slide, so um, so one way of doing it is to just say, okay, well, let's let's um, make gt times pt be equal to the gradient of some function. Some, some vector value function. And, and let's denote f as being that time derivative of p t. So uh, this is maybe a little, this isn't really overkill, but it's, it's, you have to do it this way if you want to solve it this way. You need to introduce the Green's function, which is a harmonic function on r to the d except at the origin. And um, what happens is, this is the, if we, if we write, uh, again, if we write gt times pt as being that gradient, this is the type of solution that we need. We need, we need to solve the, for the b that satisfies that its uh, Laplacian is equal to f. And the solution is, is equal to the convolution of the d-dimensional Green's function with, with f, which is the time derivative of pt. And so next slide. And so you can see that because um, G time, gt times pt is equal to the gradient of b. I can replace that in there, so I have the divergence of d, gt times pt equals f, which is equal to the partial derivative, the time derivative of pt, and that's exactly the equation that we need to solve. So in fact, you have this rule, you have this uh, identity for the solution. So you have that gt times pt is equal to this convolution. And so all you need to do now is just divide by pt, and you have the solution for gt. So if you go to the next slide. So, and, and this isn't nice because the convolution is a uh, high dimensional integral. Right, a convolution is like an integral. And I'm integrating over d dimensions, so that's not nice. So we need to kind of find a way of, uh, of, of, I mean, still using the same ideas, but not having to use such a high, or involve such a high dimensional procedure or a, a quantity. So the next slide. So what we can do is we can use um, two-dimensional convolutions. So we can write the, the divergence of gt times pt as this sum. And then what I can do is I can pair off the consecutive terms to achieve uh, part of the solution. And then if I, can, if I can solve for the part of the solution, when I sum up all those pairs of the coordinates, because again, the divergence is... Uh, is, is uh, is a linear operator, so it sums across the terms. Then you can see that I'll have d over two pairs, and so I'll have the two over d being canceled, and it'll solve my solution. And so really what you end up having is this solution. And you can see it only involves, I have gamma two there because it only involves two-dimensional integration, which is completely easy. 
to be done. So, um, yeah, and that, that two-dimensional greens function there, that gamma 2 acts on the, the tuple. And so the question is, okay, well, is it stable for particular objective functions and initial distributions? And so that's what we'll explore next. But, uh, but yeah, really, really all this is is that we, we have a differential <coughs> equation and we know we need to solve it. And the, the first way I was talking about involves this high-dimensional integration, which can't be done. And so all this is saying is just, okay, well, if we can sort of uh, solve pieces of the, uh, of the uh, differential equation at a time and sort of combine them in the end, but, but the pieces being computable themselves, because these only involve two-dimensional integrations, then maybe we're, we're okay. So, and, th and this indeed is a solution, it's a valid solution for, for the problem. So if you go to the next slide. So, um, so for, P, for P0 of theta, um, what I'm thinking of is using is using products of two-dimensional circularly symmetric Cauchy distributions. So what I mean by that is I just mean that the density uh, or the, 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 the two-dimensional density is just a function of the uh, norm of the vector. So it's like, a, I guess, a radial function? Yeah, radial function. Um, or you could use other heavy tail distributions. And the reason for using the heavy tail distributions, so our distributions whose density is decay polynomially, is because they do affect the behavior of the that change function, the GT, um, yeah, in, in 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 a very direct way, a drastic way. So the problem is that if you use uh, an initial distribution, let's say like a Gaussian or a d-dimensional Gaussian, or even a, uh, a, a two-dimensional Gaussian, um, you have GT blowing up like exponential in theta in the norm of theta, and you don't really want something like that because you know, again, there's a whole other analysis for this that is even more complicated that involves the tracking of the distribution each step. Because, again, if you're using this change function, you're, you're sort of slightly moving away from the distribution you'd like to track at each stage. And there's going to be an error that's involved with this. And if you're doing this, you know, you, you have a certain step size and you're wanting to increase this up until you get to the, the, the time, up until you get to the T final, uh, in each of those steps, you're going to be introducing some error. So there's this accumulation or aggregation of error that you need to account for. And that error at each step is intimately related with the behavior of the GT function. So if the GT function behaves undesirably, um, you, it's, it's harder to prove things. So it's, it's actually very important that the GT um, exhibits nice behavior for large values of theta. Uh, and that it also doesn't depend on the dimension, even when t is, you know, like order d or you know, d squared, things like that. Um, so, one way, you know, as I was saying before, again, we don't want gt to be dependent on the dimension. So, one way of, of overcoming this is to um, assuming that j of theta can only exhibit small changes if you change finitely many of the coordinates, or in our case, just two of the coordinates, two of the successive coordinates. And um, we don't want that to be too large, so something like eta. So what, what I, what, this motivates the definition that, um, so to find a function to have a coordinate effect of order eta, if, I cha if changing, in this case, two of the coordinates produces a change in j of at most eta. So I, and because I don't want j to change too much by changing the coordinates. Because again, if you go, could you go back? Mm -hmm. um, you can see that this is a you know uh, this is a convolution, and if I want to analyze the behavior of theta, because it's, there's a convolution going on, I'm changing two of the coordinates. Because again, a convolution is an integral, and in the, in the integrand of the integral, you're, you're integrating you know over over the pair of coordinates. So those are changing, and you know, and, and again, there's this division by pt, and the pt is something like e to the t, and that could swing exponentially. And so, what you can show is because you have this pt here, and you have the division by pt, you can use some kind of argument to show that uh, even if t is, is is moderately large, like a order d, this thing isn't going to swing exponentially. 
and it's that exponentially in D, and it's that kind of uh, coordinate effect on J that that enables us to, to get that. So just keep that in mind. Um, so you have to the next line. So um, and so what what we do is so so again J J of theta is a subject function. It doesn't necessarily satisfy this, but we want to be able to represent it in a form that enables us to have this bounded, uh, the bounded effect. So what we use is we use a symmetric function that squashes each of the coordinates and we also replicate the data. So, and there's nothing, there's nothing in design that prohibits us from doing this. So really, you know, this, this phi here is really a function of the inner product of the vector with the data. And so all I'm doing is I'm just repeating some of the coordinates and there's a, a quantity which I think I call yeah rep which is the number of times I replicate the data at the same time I have I have this eta which which uh, which um, uh, normalizes the data and then the psi function that squashes it so it puts it into the minus one to one and um, because of the beginning I was saying that this phi satisfies a Lipschitz condition you can basically show that uh, because psi is in negative one to one and x is in negative one to one if you change um, two of these coordinates, you produce a change in phi because it's Lipschitz of at most something like eta. And, and, and okay, okay, yeah, so you have the squashing and this uh, replication going on, and okay, you might think, okay, well, that, does that limit the, um, does that limit the types of parameters that we can realize? Because again, we want to realize either, you know, some, Maybe it's the parameters that are bounded in L1 norm, or maybe all of our are the D. And we don't want to be limiting that by by uh, by doing this. So there there is some analysis that that, that you can do that enable that shows what eta should be like, how it, what order it should be like, so that you don't lose any of that representability. And I think on the next slide I comment a little bit on it. Yeah. So if you have an L1 control in the internal parameters. Um, you can use a central limit theorem type argument to show that eta should be of the order like one on square root of d times the replication dimension. And so then this vector here realizes all of the parameters. And the j function, which is defined again as a linear combination of these activation functions with the residuals, satisfies that bounded coordinate. And, and also, like I was saying, as I was saying before, um, you don't want this to affect the probability of that good set because uh, the the p zero of b. Uh, if you go back, could you, could you go back by a few slides? Mm -hmm. Just um, more and more and more right to the beginning of the. Yeah, stop here. Yeah, so this b here, <coughs> you can see, is related to the size of the t. So by doing the squashing and, 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 and replication, we don't want that to change the probability of B, because the probability of B uh, will determine how large T should be. And of course, the, how large T should be is going to be related to the complexity of the problem, you know, how many of the iterations you need to do, right? Because that, you know, because I was saying, if T is at least this large, then the mean will be at least a constant factor of the maximum. And that's, that's our objective. So we don't want the squashing or replication to affect the, the P0 probability, the initial uh, distribution probability of B, that, that good set B. So now if we go back, um, yeah, and and you can show again using the same similar techniques like central limit theorem type ne techniques, you can say that B doesn't get too small. So the P zero probability is also it's like some polynomial in D, um, which of course is something that's good. Again, we don't want this. We don't. Nothing in this do we want to be exponential in dimension. We don't want t to be exponential in dimension. We don't want the bounds. Uh, we don't want the growth of g to be exponential in dimension because that really just defeats the purpose of everything. Um, and so, what this, what the final, uh, the final um, um, bound on g is, is it's sort of like the c on d times the replication dimension times the square norm of theta. And this is if you use, I think if you use the Cauchy initial distribution. So, uh, you know, distributions that sort of decay like one on 
uh, the densities that decay like one and x squared, and that's kind of like what a, how a Cauchy behaves. So this gives us increased stability, but there's there, you have the expense of a higher dimension. Uh, so you have like d times rep instead of it just being d. Um, and and the replication size it actually should be something like of order d, maybe d d uh, d squared. So so t really um, t really is something again like a polynomial in d. And so this is this is really kind of a this is this is I guess all I'd like to say about this particular solution. Um, but you can you can actually show using this that you are tracking the distribution. But again, it's 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 extremely technical. It's it's really not fun. Actually. <laughs> but yeah, I guess it kind of has to be done. Um, yeah. And so let's let's uh, yeah go to the next slide. Um, so this is another solution. So the solution before involved uh, an integration over all of R to the D, or all of R to the two. And this solution is slightly different because it's the Green's function, but we're restricting it to be in some disk of zero centered R. And this is particularly useful when you're thinking of the internal parameters of those activation functions as being bounded in say like L1 more. And um, this solution can be represented again using the same type of argument as a, a convolution of a two-dimensional integral. So again, we have the gradient of the Green's function, and then that's multiplied by the time derivative of PT. And anyways, it's, it's very it's a very similar type of situation as before. So if you go go to the next slide. Um, what this enables us to do is because we have a bounded coordinate effect, we can use a Taylor expansion to expand the integrand. So if I go, if you go back, what I'm going to be doing is expanding the integrand of this integral. So I'm going to expand the uh, partial derivative of t. So the time derivative of pt, I'm going to use a Taylor ex uh, uh, expansion to expand that around uh, actually theta j. And then I'm going to multiply it by the gradient of the two-dimensional Green's function, and I'm going to integrate everything. And then you'll get another solution. And in fact, this, this solution is much easier to kind of grasp. It's a little bit more intuitive. So that's kind of why I'm doing this. Because, you know, if you think of it in the integral, it's kind of like, well, what's a convolution doing? Convolutions are really difficult to understand on an intuitive level. So, um, yeah, that, that's, that's what I'm doing right now, is I'm going to be doing a Taylor expansion on the time derivative of PT. So if you do that. So what I do is um, the time derivative of PT is equal to J theta minus mean times PT. And the reason for this is because of the form of PT. So PT, you remember, is E to the t times j theta minus some ct, some normalizing constant, times the initial distribution. And so if you're to take the, the derivative of that, um, you can actually think of it as being uh, the mean of some other density. So we, in, in probability theory, it's called the tilted distribution. And then actually this, this is really just apparent, that, that the time derivative is going to be the, the uh, j of theta minus mu t times pt. And you can kind of do a sanity check because um, if you're to integrate out this time derivative, it should be zero, right? Because if, you if you're integrating partial derivative of something, you can use a fundamental theorem of calculus to say, well, that's just going to be like pt evaluated at its limit point, which should be zero, because density is tapered to zero at the end. And indeed, that's true, right? Because if you integrate j of theta minus mu t times pt overall theta is zero because mu t is defined to be the mean of, of pt with respect to j. So you have zero. Yeah. Um, and so what I do is uh, I, I work with that quantity, so the j of theta minus mu t times pt, and I do a Taylor expansion on that quantity. And um, yeah, expand I, but I only work on the uj coordinates, so on the on the uh, tuple of coordinates, the successive uh, j, jth and j plus first entry. 
and I expand that about theta j. And that gives rise to this expression. And then what I said I'll be doing is once I have this Taylor expansion, I'm going to multiply this by the uh, gradient of the Green's function, two-dimensional Green's function, and then I'm going to integrate. And then we'll see what, what happens on the next slide. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so like the, the J's are um, indexing the tuples, right? Yeah, the J's are indexing the tuples. So like, how do you know what, what tuples to use? Like, is, is well, you just, I mean, it's true. I'm, I'm doing, I'm using successive tuples. So it's just, so, so you know, if I have, if the original vector is like theta 1, theta 2, theta d, I'm just doing theta 1, theta 2, oh, theta so 3, they're, theta 4. So they're just, uh, they're just successive. Next to each other. It doesn't matter. They're just adjacent ones. Yeah, I, actually, I mean, they're, that, that would be kind of, it would be interesting to explore what other type, what, other, what stuff you can get if you're not necessarily using that. I mean, maybe you could be using like, Theta one and theta five, or something like that. It doesn't matter. Or it, yeah, it, it it really doesn't matter. I mean, the reason that I the reason that I that I, I did it in this particular way is just because I wanted to break down that differential equation I need to solve uh, in, in sort of its parts because because the the solution is is a divergence. The divergence of some quantity needs to be equal to some something else, and that divergence is a sum. And so all I did is I say, okay, well, if I can solve say two of the terms in that sum at a time, then then I get the solution. And I've just chosen those terms to be the successive uh, uh, pairs of, of the index set. Yeah. yeah, it's a good question. Um, so easy, yeah, now, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply this by, um, by <coughs> the gradient of the two-dimensional Green's function, I'm gonna integrate it. And there, there's some factor of two over d but it's, yeah, it's not that important. Um, so, so really what we get then is we get that the, um, this, this particular solution, because remember GT is a vector, and so this particular um, pair or, or, uh, or pair of coordinates of that GT has this solution. And actually, I, I just realized that there's a mistake here. This should be the theta J, so it actually should be the, the Success of the, the coordinates of theta. Here's the coordinates of theta. So really, what this is kind of saying is that okay, well, you you move in the direction depending on the sign of j theta minus mu t from where you were at previously, and then there's some other uh, sort of uh, higher order terms that you need to deal with. And I think what was, what was kind of interesting initially was that the that the, this m matrix that we got. Um, was was something that was a non-negative definite matrix, and so what what this actually kind of sh what, what this shows is if you do a little bit more work that if you're in some kind of neighborhood or close to the optimal value, then these change functions actually push you up <coughs> uphill in, into a nice uh, into into a nice domain. And of course, if you kept doing this over and over again, you would eventually approach that, that maximum. It might not necessarily be the maximum; it might be uh, you know, uh, where the up to a constant factor of the, of the maximum of the j. Um, so that was, that was kind of encouraging to, to do this, and that's kind of why I wrote this out here. But the problem is that we need the gts to be, uh, to stay within that ball. Because the problem is if they go outside the ball, the solution explodes. And I'm not exactly clear at this point how to do that. We're kind of working on it. I mean, one of the ideas is to um, modify J by multiplying it by some um, uh, elephant stand shaped function. Because you can see what happens is if theta, if theta here is close to the, this theta J here, mm -hmm. theta J here, the leading term is close to the boundary. Um, if, if J theta minus mu T is positive, it might, it might push you outside of that and you don't want that. So what we're, what we're kind of experimenting with right now, and we've gotten some, some interesting results, is what, what if we modify the J theta function, so we multiply it by a, uh, an elephant stand shaped function. So it's sort of flat on the top and it tapers down uh, uh, linearly. And then what that would do is that when theta is sort of near the boundary, you would have uh, J of theta being less than its mean. Because its mean you know, would be concentrated where most of the mass is. And that would be where sort of the peak of that elephant stand happens. And so then at the boundary, you would have that uh, J of theta being 
uh, being less than its mean, so then that quantity would be negative, and then that would still force you back in the ball. Um, and and also, uh, you know, I'm kind of ignoring the behavior of the uh, higher order terms, but those can actually be managed um, uh, using the fact that uh, that M matrix is is uh, non negative definite. That's that's a property that's useful. So yeah, th these are these are some ways of um, of overcoming that. Um, so if you go to the next slide, I'm not exactly sure if I. Yeah, this is this is what I was saying earlier. Is that you could you could modify J in that way to maybe get rid of some of that. Um, yeah. So so I guess the conjectured conclusion, the sort of conclusion of all this, if you didn't follow along with all of it, um, really the conclusion is just that if you have a step size h of something that's like one over a polynomial, and a number of steps that's in the polynomial of polynomial in n and d, um, then with high probability of design, the above procedure should produce optimization paths for which the distribution um, is closely tracked and maybe some some um, 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 norm on, on probability measures like an L1 norm or maybe a callback Leibner um, distance such that with high probability those solutions that this procedure is produced via those changes, change functions, um, have instances of our objective function that are within at least half of its maximum. And that's of course what the desired goal is for, for the greedy strategy. So the consequence is that the relaxed greedy strategy is feasible and it achieves those indicated bounds, those risk bounds that I was talking about before. And right now we really only have results for, for sparse linear combinations from these dictionaries that have um, bounded uh, L1 norm of internal parameters. But I, but I actually do want to say something about that because you might be like, okay, well, you know, if, if I have um, uh, um, if I have these, these Lipschitz activation functions with bound internal parameters, like isn't that kind of going to limit the types of functions that I can model? And so if I go, I'm going to, I actually want to kind of go back. I want to go back to the first slide, uh, or the first where I where I talk about the. Uh, uh, no, just yeah. When I talk about the the quantities, um, those spectral quantities. Here. Yeah. 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 So, so actually. Um, what you can show is you can see kind of this hierarchy uh, of the bounds in terms of the conditions uh, that you need for the function to be in the closure of the convex hull of these uh, dictionary elements with these specific activation functions. So again, you know, this theory wouldn't hold for um, uh, cosine functions. I mean, cosine functions aren't sigmoids. Uh, they are Lipschitz. Um, step functions are, of course, aren't Lipschitz. They're, they're discontinuous. Um, but ramp functions are. Ramp functions are. And um, we, we have a paper that's coming up soon that, that actually takes advantage of that. And it, it, it really says that if you have a ramp function um, of this form, uh, you know, just, just a ramp function like that, then with this condition on the on the uh, the spectral norm condition, you can in fact model those Fs as being linear combinations of ramp functions, which are Lipschitz, and whose internal parameters are bounded. See, because the problem is that if you're using step functions, you know, if you want to be able to realize different types of activation functions, the gain that you need need it has to be arbitrary, right? Because the sigmoids, as the gain of a sigmoid increases you start approximating a, uh, a, an indicator function or, or, a, or a step function I should say um, and a shifted step step function and and clearly that wouldn't be feasible for our purposes because the the size of the internal coefficients would need to be come unbounded so it's not it actually isn't very good to model things using step functions for this theory so and, but you can see that with ramp functions there's a bit of a trade-off because you need to assume a slightly stronger condition, um, but it, but again, what you what you get with the ramp functions is you get um, 
you get the Lipschitz property and you get the fact that the uh, internal parameters are bounded and you can still realize these very general types of functions. So, um, you know, if f is, say, a Gaussian function, then, then that, r that, uh, that f sub ramp is, is of order d. Right? That's just an example. Whereas with the step function case, it was square root d. So you lose a little bit, but it's still not that bad. Um, yeah, and, um, and another thing is you, you might also want to consider using quadratic splines, and that's, that's a potential for future research, because those are, those are quite interesting. Um, and, and the reason being is because they're, they're, they're differentiable. They're bounded differentiable. Uh, and, and those have an advantage over the ramp functions. The ramp functions are Lipschitz, but they're not uh, differentiable at the boundary. Or, or sorry, at the, uh, the origin. Um, yeah, and, and actually what's, what's really interesting about these types of things, I just want to make one more, one more comment. What's really interesting about these things is that we're using um, specific types of norms to characterize these errors, and these are the L2 norms. But you don't need to consider just L2 norms. Um, these, a lot of these approximation error results hold for, um, for uh, LP norms, and, and in fact, you really don't even lose that much, even if you're working with L infinity norms. You can, so, so, I think basically the take-home is that these uh, modeling functions as linear combinations of uh, these types of activation functions are extremely powerful, and they allow you to model very, very, very general types of functions. And um, and so and so yeah. R right now the push is really to to get these uh, push push forward to see how how general we can make these results without these specific assumptions on on the activation functions and on the size of the parameters. And that's sort of the goal for for the future. Um, yeah. So I think we're the last. Yeah, that's the last slide. Okay. Yeah. So we have uh, plenty of time for questions. Uh, so, fire away. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to understand the evolution that you proposed. So if, if no, I sorry, the what? The evolution. The evolution. Yeah. Yeah. The equation. Right? Yeah. So I'm trying to understand it. So if I take the naive approach, uh, am I going to find that the general case of this uh, evolution leads to the... Sorry, I, I, sorry, it's kind of... The, uh, the steepest gradient descent, it would it be... Uh, one yeah, see, the, the, the problem is that... <coughs> so gradient descent is sort of a special case of this. The problem is that gradient descent doesn't really... The problem with gradient descent is that it's very... It, it really likes and it only pays attention to, to local behavior. And that's not good. I mean, you know, you could have you could have functions that are wild all over the place, and you don't want to get stuck in some um, uh, lo local optimum. Uh, that's not good. And so, what 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 these annealing strategies do is they consider really what happens globally, and that's really important for these types of questions because it's not like saying, okay, well, it's it's kind of like saying, well, how much given given uh, these the, the, the PT sort of puts mass. Over all of the domain, mm -hmm. and 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 what it does is it kind of says, okay, well, pay attention to those areas that has more mass. So actually, in the Mitch equation, that it's happening. well, no, I mean this, I mean this is the idea. This is the reason that that what enables you to get the mean speed to come within a constant factor of the maximum if you sample from that, because again, the mean is characterizing what ha what's happening on average with the distribution as the as the time. And how it, it's that right, compare it to stochastic gradient, for example? Because it seems you mean if you add some noise? No, basically when you pick just uh, pairs of, of variables and you do the gradient descent in that so basically subspace, and you pick another. Well, I mean, it's it's th this is completely different because it's adaptive. So the the, the dis I mean it, it, the theta the iterates are random. I mean so the, so you know with with uh, with stochastic gradient descent, like yeah, you're you're adding noise and you are you are you are changing the distribution of the iterates, but they're, what are they tracking? Are they, are they tracking something that you really want to be sampling from? And so you you have to sort of you have to update and modify your approach as you go along. You don't want to just be saying okay, well let's add some noise and then let's see what happens and like hopefully it'll it'll land in a, in a you know, it'll be landing in a good 
domain, you, you want to be adapting the approach and you want to be seeing, okay, well, if I change it, if I add some noise, maybe it's Gaussian, maybe it's some other uh, he heavy tail distribution, but you want to be able to say, okay, well, the next step, what's the distribution? And, and, and these, the, this distribution I've, I've just told you about has nice properties. We want to be able to sample from them. So we want to specifically evolve those iterates in a way so that we can sample from that distribution. So you sample from a global distribution over, over time? Yeah, right. And so, I mean, the idea is that, like, okay, we, we would like to be able to sample from PT in just one shot, right? It's like, okay, well, why not just do that? The problem is you can't because it's, 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 a, it's a complicated distribution. You know, it involves the, the J function, which the J is a linear combination of, of, of a bunch of things, and it, it, it would just, you couldn't sample from it. So, yeah, or the normal, yeah, you have a normalization constant, you need to compute, and, and that would just be very in, ineffective. So, so what you need to do is you need, you, 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 need to, you need to take samples from an initial distribution that's easy to sample from and then find out, okay, well, how do I need to change those iterates at each step so that, you know, it's easy to compute and that it's, it's, it's distribution at the next step is only being slightly perturbed from that desired distribution, the PT that we'd like to sample from. And, um, and so again, this all comes into what I was saying, that one of the major obstacles in, the, in this analysis is that, yes, at each step, you are losing a bit of, the, um, of, of, of how close you are to the target distribution, or the distribution you'd like to sample from. And this happens at each step, size of order h, and you're, you're, and, and you're, you're going at a time from zero to some t final. And so there's gonna be this accumulation of errors at every step. And, and like I was saying at the end, that that's kind of the difficulty in these things, is trying to manage that and keep that under control and to, uh, uh, yeah, incorporate that into the analysis. But, but again, I, I, think, I think really what the take home is that, is, is that with, with these methods that you really do need to pay attention to the global behavior. And when you're modifying the iterates in any procedure, you need to be able to say, okay, well, what, am I do what exactly am I doing to them? How am I changing them? And is it going to be steering me in, in, a, in a direction that's desirable? Um, because I, I guess you know I kind of more take a theoretical approach to it because I'm interested in, in, in coming up with like pr you know, provable strategies. So I'm not saying that these things are like you know the best. That's exact. That's the way that you would naturally want to uh, go ahead doing something. And gradient descent is still great for some problems and, and still useful. But um, I, um, I I really think that you that, that you do need to be paying attention to this. The, the global landscape. Um, I also mentioned earlier that there's some tensor methods that are being used now. Um, and we've also had some success in trying to incorporate uh, this strategy into that. But that's sort of, that, that theory is kind of still in its infancy right now. Um, I know there have been a couple papers recently on, on neural network training with the tensor methods. and. Uh, yeah, although they don't really fit too well in with the uh, uh, model-generated data that, that we've been assuming here, um, but it's still very interesting. So, and, and again, those tensor methods also, they, they pay attention to the global behavior of the problem. They don't just focus on, and that's really the major shortcoming of any type of gradient descent method. So. Okay, one more as a group, and then... Yeah, I'm not sure if my question even makes sense. So, no, sure. we, uh, so in the beginning you have a set of functions, mm -hmm. and you do linear combination of this set of functions. Uh, do you know how many functions you have at the beginning? Is it set? Oh or yeah. So actually, yeah, yeah, that, 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 that's a really, really good question. Um, yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up. So, yeah, I mean, how many how many functions should you know how to use? Uh, that's that's a definitely an important question to ask. So, um, what you can do is you can actually select that M. Um, adaptively. So the, these risk bounds that I've, I've presented a lot, they, they, they also can be extended so that um, you're doing an adaptive selection or that you sort of have a stopping rule for how many how many of them to use. That's data dependent. So, so a stopping criterion that says, okay, we'll stop, you know, if M is greater than this amount and then you use that maybe and then, you know, it'll come into the risk analysis and that'll still give you 
it, exactly the same type of balance that I was presenting. But yeah, that's absolutely important. It's like how you shouldn't you should know how many to use, and you should if you're thinking like a statistician, you should let the data decide how many you should use. And so you wanna you wanna you wanna uh, come up with a theory that incorporates that, and that's that is also possible. So. Yeah. Just to know that there's a problem with um, overfitting and using gradient descent. Yeah. Because, uh, yours, your uh, from your problem seems very specific. I mean, wouldn't that be a case of overfitting with that? Yeah, I mean, overfitting is is an issue with with, with neural networks. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, so overfitting is in bad in what sense to you? Um, doesn't generalize well. It it doesn't generalize it. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess, I, I, I yeah. I haven't really thought about the implications of how overfitting does affect this stuff, um, but yeah, that would be that would be something that's interesting to consider. Cool. So let's um, thank one more time, and then. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Rose.